So Renato, how screwed is George Santos? Uh, it's complicated. I'm Renato Mariotti. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent, and I'm a legal contributor for ABC News. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down into a soundbite or a tweet. So Renato, <laughs> I love talking about George Santos. He, George Santos is one of these people, if you look fraud up in the dictionary or encyclopedia, <laughs> his photo's like, there, right? His face, yeah. Yeah, he's very, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, he is, he is such a character because I, I there's, a, there's a lot to talk about here, but one of the things that is just crazy about Santos is he is like a legit hardcore fraudster. And, and what I mean is- Is like, it beyond fraud? Like he's got, I think, like- some kind of severe disorder, like whatever, you know, the, when people steal with the compulsion, you know, they're kleptomaniacs, like he is whatever it is that you just literally lie about everything. Well, that's what I mean. I, so that's what I mean, hardcore fraudster. Like there are people who commit fraud because they get themselves in a bad situation. It happens all the time. Like I prosecuted people who were real estate developers during the crash and they were short on cash. So they did whatever they felt like they needed to do to keep their business afloat, which included fraud. Okay. That's one thing, you know, maybe you'll have somebody like Sam Bankman freed. We talked about him sometimes like, well, he was in a very particular situation involving a particular company. He wasn't defrauding like his taxi cab drivers and his mom. He was defrauding like, you know, in a very specific company. With George Santos, you get the sense he's like ripping off everybody. Like I mean, he all just, over the place. Like it's like he right. can't help himself. So can we do a recap of what he's what he did? Oh it's well, been a while. It's well, wow, it's been a long time. And and it got there was like a superseding indictment. Like he got charged with all sorts of stuff. I will say, by the way, though, that he's not alone. Like I did prosecute people like Santos because he's uh these people just can't help themselves. They're constantly committing fraud. But all right, so he okay. did also. He had like a whole bunch. Oh my of, god, it's so much stuff. It's so much stuff. It's crazy. Okay, would you want to so, walk through? You want to walk through those different schemes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. So he's pleaded guilty to wire fraud and aggravated identity theft. Um, but a part as a part of this, here here are the actual. So he, in general, just to, you know, bottom line up front recap before we get into some of the stuff. He embezzled funds from campaign donors, charged credit cards without authorization, obtained unemployment benefits through fraud, and lied in reports to the U.S. House of Representatives. He also lied to the FEC by inflating, I think. That's right. So he filed fraudulent FEC reports by uh, saying that um, he inflated contributions that were supposedly made by family members, but they weren't actually made by family members. And then he claimed that he himself had loaned the campaign big amounts of money and he had not. I'm sorry. That's right. So he, he self-reported that he had loaned his campaign half a million dollars when he had a total of $8,000 in his bank accounts. I mean, it's yeah. uh, something. The And the, I will say one thing that just to put a finer point on it, you talked about credit cards, credit card fraud or identity theft. He actually took credit cards of people who contributed to his campaign. Yes. Like when you give them your credit card number to like run it for the campaign, like he literally took that and then he committed credit card fraud with his own contributors' credit cards, which is pretty amazing. Yes. So he embezzled first funds from the campaign donors. So they would donate money and then instead those funds were tran transferred to his personal bank account and he bought clothing and, you know, did whatever he wanted. Um, and then, yeah. So then he also had a scheme to steal the identity and financial information of these contributors. Which is just amazing to me. It's like, it's amazing. People, these are people giving him free money, effectively giving his campaign money and they would potentially donate in the future. 
Uh, and instead he was taking their credit cards and using them for whatever, for his own right. gain. Credit card fraud. Then there was his unemployment fraud scheme. Yes. So he was, I think if my recollection was, I think he was applying for unemployment, falsely saying he was unemployed. I think even though he was, he was employed at a Florida based investment firm. Yeah. And made a big deal, deal, I think, about his employment in the campaign during that yeah. time. And he continued to. So when you're on unemployment, you have to like basically on a weekly basis kind of say, yes, I'm still unemployed. And he basically did that, continued to do that, even though he was like actually receiving a salary. So this is, my thing is like, and I'm sure this is true of a lot of fraudsters, but like he had to know he was going to get caught. I mean, this is so dumb. Well, I think I'll just say I know a lot about fraudsters because I investigated them, prosecuted them for years. Um, I often uh, nowadays represent people who are alleged to commit fraud or people who are victims of fraud. Like I've done a lot in this space. And people who are really, really hardcore fraudsters like believe their own BS. So they buy their own bullshit um, or they just sort of repeat lies so often that they just can't help themselves. I think that people who are as hardcore as, as Santos, they do understand that they're lying. There's no question about that, but they get themselves into a mindset where they just buy it so much. They, they believe, believe their it. own hype. Yeah. I mean, I had prosecuted a guy one time who, while he was out on bond, so we convicted him of federal crimes. He, he tried to escape by the way. Okay. Like abscond to Canada. But then while he's out on bond, he engaged in like romance scams where he was romancing uh, women in, um, you know, using Internet uh, uh, dating sites and then was using that money on like sugar, maybe websites, sugar daddy websites. So, you know, it, using their funds for that while he's on bond out on bond for for committing, you know, federal crimes. So, I mean, it, these, some of these people just can't help themselves. Like you said, it's a compulsion and they, they just are what they are. I think Santos definitely is in that category because if you're a fraudster running for office is a great way of shining a big light on what you're doing. Yes. Um, I just, I, the whole thing, I mean, the, just the every day, you know, there was that period of time when like literally every day something new was coming out that he had lied about, even if it wasn't necessarily a violation of the law, but like his religion, like where his parents are from, where he was from places he had worked. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy because uh, you know, some of this is you could, you could understand it to a certain extent, like some of the lies during his campaign, I think were necessary in order to, for him to sort of maintain a certain image. He was trying to say whatever to get elected. Necessary is not the right word, by the way, because it's not necessary to lie to get elected, but it was to achieve a certain purpose. I get it. Lying, you know, you mentioned that he lied to the House of Representatives. There he was overstating his salary and overstating his income and assets and so forth to try to make himself seem bigger than he was. But stuff like stealing the credit card numbers of his constituents. Wasn't he involved in a puppy scheme? Puppy? Wait, like There what? was something with him and adoption of puppies. Oh my God. I, I don't know. I don't remember that. That was not part of the indictment, but it wasn't a part name. of the indictment, but anyway, okay. I'm going to look this up. So while you're looking up the puppy scam, let me talk a little bit about what this means and what, this yeah, he stole like. puppies from the Amish. You're kidding me. <laughs> Are you, is that serious? Is this like some, just like, <laughs> like somebody on Twitter came up with this or is this like legit, like no, reported by a legitimate ABC news, 15 news? I just go Googled Santos and puppies. Um, Politico reported that Santos was charged with theft in 2017 for stealing puppies from Amish dog breeders in Pennsylvania. Multiple bad checks wild. totaling more than $15,000 were written in his name to the breeders. And then he, Oof. this is right. Then he, la he later held an adoption event with his charity, Friends of Pets United at a state at a Staten Island pet store. So he stole the puppies and then he tried to sell them from the Amish. That's amazing. 
I mean, what a crime, right? Now, the, the dollar amount there, the ironic thing is the dollar amount there was so small, he, you know, nothing really much happened to him. But if you could imagine a crime that would more piss off a jury, that is like, if you're a fraudster, that's about as bad as it goes. You're defrauding the Amish out of puppies. I mean, he's basically like Cruella de Vil. Yeah, no kidding. Um, that's insane. So, well, let me just say people. So we asked, we talked in the beginning, like, how screwed is this guy? Well, he's, you know, he pled guilty to fraud. He pulled, he pled guilty to aggravated identity theft. There's very much a movement in federal criminal sentencing for white collar crimes in particular to not have lengthy prison sentences for these. The idea being that it's just not worth the public resources and it's not a good use of, 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 of resources and so forth for him to, to do this. But as part of the deal, he is facing a minimum sentence of two years in prison, uh, at least for this, which is, I actually think is pretty significant for a white collar case. Some of our listeners, viewers on YouTube are going to be like, no, this is not that significant to them, but two years minimum is significant. Now, the question is, how much more does he get? He's also going to have to pay restitution of $373,000. He's going to forfeit another $205,000. So let's say it's another $573,000 out of his pocket. So here's my question, though. I think there's some irony that white-collar criminals, particularly those who engage in fraud, um, are you know, that there's a movement for less jail time because I would think the recidivism rate for this is very high, as per this guy of yours that you were doing. I mean, right? And then there's that that fire festival guy who I think he's working on the Trump campaign now, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know, but, but, but yeah, like he also was charged with it with crimes for the fire fraud scheme. And if you watch the documentary, like he's like on to another scam, even while he's like awaiting trial for that. So I just would think that the recidivism rate is very high for these types of people because of, you know, maybe it's a compulsion. Maybe it's like a gambling thing, like where they just like need that. They, they just want the money really fast. And I don't know. It seems like prison would be a perfect place for them. Yeah. A few thoughts on it. One is, I mean, I think there certainly is people have talked about, a, a, you know, incarceration epidemic or whatever term you want to use for it. The United States is a very, very high incarceration rate compared to other countries. A lot of that is narcotics. Though. Like if you're looking at federal incarceration, like if you're looking at federal sentencing, in terms of length of sentences, you know, that really to make a dent in the incarceration rate, you really need to focus on narcotics crimes, which whether that's a victimless crime or a, victim, a crime that has victims is a matter of one's perspective. And there's a lot of debate about that, but I think that has to be the focus if you're thinking about actually making a dent in incarceration. But what I was doing to you is just literally reporting to you what the reality is, which is there's this movement, including in the guidelines itself, sentencing federal sentencing guidelines itself to reduce incarceration rates, not just for, um, not just for, um, you know, uh, narcotics crimes, but particularly for white collar crimes. And I guess my view on it is somebody who's in, you know, been on both sides of that is that first of all, I think that the amount of resources devoted to fighting white collar crime is relatively small. Um, which, you know, which, you know, depending on what way you cut it. I mean, in other words, it's, it's an interesting thing is that I think most white collar crime is not caught and not prosecuted. I'm sure a lot of e. Donald Trump. Yeah, I well, yeah. Or I mean, just something that may also kind of resonate with our viewers or listeners. Like, haven't any of you ever gotten like all these people trying to scam you out of whatever? Like, don't you get these phone calls and emails and attempts to say, Hey, you know, I've got a bazillion dollars in Nigeria, or you should invest in this, or you should do that, or uh pretending you be your bank or whatever, right? There's like lots and lots and lots of scammers out there. There's something now called pig, pig butchering that people, you know, have, have just drawn increasing um, attention. But the bottom line is there's lots and lots of scams. Um, it's in, and, and that's why you have to click so many different things to confirm who you are. It's why every time you wire money, you have to jump through so many hoops nowadays because 
There's so much fraud around that. There's all these hackers. There's all sorts of crime and yet white collar ish type crime. And yet only a fraction of that, a very, 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 very tiny fraction of that is ever investigated or prosecuted. And I think that is the biggest issue when it comes to deterrence. Um, it, because as a practical matter, we're focusing a lot more of our attention on violent crime and on narcotics crimes. But I would say separ separately, Asha, I think, you know, in terms of fraud defendants, I would put them in categories. And I don't know what's more, what's worse or not. I mean, I think the Santos type people, recidivism, recidivism is a huge concern. For the, let's say, Sam Bankman Freed to the world, it's less so. In other words, I don't know if Sam Bankman Freed's going to found another bazillion dollar internet company, or excuse me, or a crypto company and in, and defraud people of, you know, a billion dollars or something. But the the size and scope of what he did was so great that we take that seriously, right? And I don't, you know, I think judges wrestle with how to weigh those different factors. Is that is that fair? Maybe, but I do think that it sort of... Um discounts the real impact of the victim of, of the imp the impact of these crimes on victims and that the threat of them has gone up in a digital age in um an age of electronic transactions like all of these things um in other words it might be outdated yeah i think that we have to come up with a better solution to fighting white collar crime and we don't devote enough resources to it. And I think that- I mean, real people get hurt. Like if you think about the guy, the people who were convicted in Enron and they also got like nothing, correct? Yeah. They got nothing. That's right. And no, there were people who literally lost their entire life savings. Right. As a result of that. Well, that's why I said you have to weigh it differently. That's the point is like, and are, are Enron executives recidivists in the same way Santos is? Probably not. But the impact of what they did was greater. They're like a Sam Bankman Freed. I put them in that category where they did something that has a very huge impact, right? The numbers for what Sam Bankman Freed did were massive, but he's not like a Santos guy, right? Who's stealing everyone's credit card numbers, you know, and just can't help himself. But, but recidivism, recidivism is the only one thing you look at. I, I think I that, just want to push back. I don't know how you can say that they're not recidivists. I don't think that they're rehabilitated. So, you know, it may be true that they're, they are only going to go big or go home and maybe the next opportunity for them may not come for a while. Like they're not content with just stealing puppies from the Amish and reselling them. Um, you know, they want something bigger, but I would not say that they have no recidivism risk, especially if they get out and somehow are allowed to get back into that world. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think what they do is very serious. It depends on the circumstance. But a lot of times if they're a business owner and they just see an opportunity and it's very lucrative for them, it may they're, they're so, uh, those people in my experience are wired differently than the Santoses of the world. They tell a lie in a certain context. They want their startup to be successful um, or whatever it ends up being. But they're not quite like Santos, where they just well, can't Santos, help themselves. I think has a like a mental disorder, right? And that's what. The, but you were talking. We started. But you don't have to have about, a mental disorder to be a recidivist. Is my point. Yeah, that's fair. But I think a lot of those people, it's like a crime of opportunity. I mean, the people that I, if I was going to say, like, what is the in white collar crime? What's a something that impacts so many Americans that isn't addressed well enough? Is what do we do about people who are repeatedly stealing? just enough money to make it real money, but not enough to make it worth fe the feds investigating people who are stealing a hundred K at a time in, you know, crypto or people who are hacking scam the elderly. Like my mom got scammed. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And they keep scamming the elderly out of 50 K and no prosecutor is going to go and investigate and make a federal case out of 50 K. You have to aggregate all these cases up, which can be very challenging to do. And those people are not just recidivists, but they're professionals. They're organized, they're efficient, and they are creating criminal organizations to take fraud and aggregate it up. And so from a crime prevention perspective, like those are the people that I really want to figure out. The, the, the hackers, people keep hacking 
big companies and trying to hold them hostage, right? In exchange for Bitcoin or whatever. Those people are all um, highly problematic and very difficult to detect and very difficult to prosecute. I think they're the biggest problem. Um, but the Santoses of the world um, are the ones that tend to tend to get caught very easily by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Okay, so he's going to get, what, two years in prison, maybe? He'll definitely get two. The question is to get three, four, or five. I mean, the interesting thing is, Asha, the well, judge... Won't they, won't they hold him maybe to a little bit of a higher bar since he was holding a position of public trust? Yes, and I also think... You know, one thing that's important is at federal sentencing, all of your experience gets uh, your entire life history, history and characteristics of the defendant are considered by the judge. So stealing uh, puppies or whatever, like writing bad checks to the Amish and then selling their puppies away. I mean, that's the sort of thing. If I was prosecuting this case, I would put that up there. Like, judge, this guy's only stealing from the Amish, he's stealing puppies and taking, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. Like stealing yeah. puppies for some judges, that would be like the worst thing ever. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, Santos has a real opportunity to be, uh, I think held accountable and held to a higher standard and potentially to receive whatever it is, three, four five, six years in prison. I don't think it's going to be, Double digits. I mean, he could receive up to 22 years. I don't see that happening um, or even close. But I think it's going to be interesting to see what he, what his mitigation is and how he sort of presents at sentencing, uh, um, you know, he, the picture of himself. It's, it's going to be very interesting, Asha, because it's a very different picture of Santos than we've ever seen before. I mean, he's been defiant. Remember, he talked about running as an independent and doing all these mm -hmm. things. And now I assume he's going to be contrite and say he has some sort of disease, like you suggest. Well, we'll see. I guess he'll have to make that plea in February, right? When, when he's in front of the judge. Yeah, that'll be really something. Okay. So, I mean, I guess we have to come clean with our listeners. There's just not a lot of, you know, the Trump related legal news that we haven't already discussed. So, um, that's why we thought the Santos thing was interesting. And now we kind of want to just look at other legal news, which one thing that I know I got called for ABC, um, was it last week? But I wasn't able to go on, but it was intriguing, uh, was that they had arrested some doctors in the Matthew Perry case and his death. Yeah, I mean, it's a really remarkable case, Asha, because... Even putting aside the fact that Matthew Perry is the was the victim here, of obviously well known actor um, who m many of us grew up watching, yeah. um, big fan of. But you know the, the the behavior here is pretty outrageous. Yeah. Um, I know when I was a federal prosecutor, we took prosecution of doctors very seriously. There are some really heinous doctors out there that we prosecuted. And I think they're just like you were mentioning that we hold public officials to a higher standard. I think people, um, including federal prosecutors, hold doctors to a higher standard. And it's expecting, you know, there's an expectation that they are they've sworn their lives to do no harm, uh, not to potentially endanger people by giving them access to dangerous medications. Yeah. And speaking of opportunists, I mean, the doctors here were really uh, it was disgusting. I mean, they completely knew that they were taking advantage of this person and they knew that the dosages that they were giving were lethal. Yeah. And, and I one mean, of them like Googled it. Yeah. And they also, I mean, the, the, the communications here are really, really bad. I mean, and you know, the tech, the one text message that stood out to me is one of them was discussing uh, the, you know, the, uh, you know, selling drugs to um, to Perry's people. And, and he's like, I wonder how much this moron will pay. Mm -hmm. And the response is, let's find out. I mean, that is you put that up. I mean, if I, if I was prosecuting this case, if I was prosecuting this case, it would be in the opening statement, closing arguments. Like I would put that up on a screen for the jury. Like, look at this text. That's that's what they're focused on here, right? Is 
what how much will this moron pay and they were in fact marking it up by like like a thousand percent or whatever yeah well of course you're getting it illicitly right i mean yeah i mean that's absolutely crazy and this is a doctor by the way who said that a 42 year old doctor like this is not you know somebody who just uh you know worked at cvs and took took it off the shelf like this is literally a uh, an actual well, medical doctor i don't know a lot about this drug is it, yeah yeah it is a very powerful settlement it is very power, power powerful sedative excuse me and it is a controlled substance so um at, you know absolutely what's the medical use for it just i don't know um i think it may be i'm not sure what it's used for that's a great question like is it the kind of thing that you would get coming out of the hospital for some procedure and then you get hooked on it that's interesting you know i don't know i mean i'm looking here let me look at the yeah it's the ketamine is a pr fda approved for induction and maintenance of general anesthesia during surgical procedures so there you go okay. this is a very powerful sedative and you need to have a, a healthcare professional there to monitor a patient who had just been given ket ketamine so that's all in the indictment itself i'm quoting the indictment and so you literally have to have access to certain life-saving equipment, you know, including a defibrillator as supplemental oxygen, et cetera, if you're administering ketamine, because that's something that you would administer to somebody if you're literally putting them under. So basically in terms of the case, this seems like a slam dunk. Yeah, I think so. And you, one thing that one sign that I will just say that you could see here is the non-doctors agree to be charged by information. And so, you know, I'm assuming that they're basically going to be cooperating and pleading something along those lines. That would be my guess. Or they're on a fast track to a guilty plea. The doctors have been charged in an indictment and, and they are looking at a very serious sentence. I mean, they're, I think a mandatory minimum, of 10 years in prison so that's a very no, wait what are the precise charges so they're charged with they're charged with distribution um conspiracy to distribute ketamine which is a controlled substance uh and then distribution of ketamine resulting in death possession with intent to distribute methamphetamine which meth um you know possession with intent to distribute and distribution of ketamine Ex you know, maintaining a drug involved premises, altering and falsifying records related to a federal investigation, et cetera. The thing is that drug cases, I mean, first of all, drug crimes, we talked about this kind of feeds into what we discussed earlier. Drug crimes are, you know, we have carry very serious penalties, often very significant mandatory minimums. And this is congressional. I mean, that's why to really change something, it's not changing the guidelines. There's a congressional, um, element here where the Cong Congress passed statutes that had five, 10, 20 year mandatory minimums. And that really skyrockets things. And there are also cases that can be easy to prove. Typical drug cases is identity is the main issue. You know, in other words, uh, if Asha is the person with the five kilos of cocaine, you're guilty. Um, it really, the, you know, the question is just, were you the person who did it? And you could say it's powdered sugar or something, but you know, or you thought it was, but assuming you knew you were possessing cocaine, you're screwed. And here, the only thing that would ordinarily make this more complicated is their doctors. And so if it's a doctor distributing controlled substances, it's like, well, I thought I had a medical reason to do it. Given the circumstances here, um, I don't think that's going to be an issue. I mean, yeah. you, you, well, you can, you, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, that seems to me that they would have to show that a, there was like, that this fell within some realm of medical protocol and also that they didn't have the intent to, you know, that, that their intention was somehow to help him. I mean, the intent kind of goes out the window when you see those, um, those communications. Um, but I do think like don't doctors, I think probably the, the biggest kind of latitude they have is to some scope of discretion in terms of being able to administer sort of services because you don't want, you know, I mean, we're, we're seeing now the ramifications with like these abortion laws of, of when you essentially tie liability to a doctor's, you know, w when there are close calls or when there's gray areas, they don't, you know, you don't want to tie their hands um, 
but in this case, I it feels like this is so far beyond the scope of what would be that any doctor. I mean, they, you would just put up a bunch of experts who'd be like, this would never happen. Yeah, I think that's right. And and just to be clear, I mean, there are a lot of cases against doctors that are more questionable. Um, sometimes the DOJ loses cases where a doctor is charged with like over prescribing opioids, for example, and saying like they knew that this person didn't need all of this X, like whatever that is, like particular prescription uh, 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 controlled substance. And essentially they're saying like, you should have known that this person didn't need all this Percocet or whatever. And the doctors often have a viable defense, which is the patient came in and said X, Y, Z, A, B, C. I, th I believe them. And they're going to say, well, you didn't notice this, or you should have questioned that. And then it, it looks much more like to a jury that this is a doctor who maybe made a mistake or wasn't diligent enough, but not a doctor who should be, you know, uh, labeled a convicted felon for distributing controlled substances. Here, um, I don't think that that's going to be a problem. In fact, one thing that's very telling, Asha, is, you know, and we used to do this uh, ourselves when I was a federal prosecutor, when we were charging things is, we would put it here, you know, this is United States of America versus Jasmine Sangha, a.k.a. quote, the ketamine queen, unquote. Oh. Yeah, and exactly. And then Salva, Salvador Placentia, Placentia, a.k.a. Dr. P. But the point is, well, whenever you use those a.k.a.s, it's a way of sort of saying, like, this is how they're referred to in the docs. It's just a bit of shade. I'd yeah, say. yeah, How's yeah. The prosecutor, the ketamine queen. Yeah, that's that's tough. Um, that's, that's tough to get over. Yeah. So this is a case for what it's worth. I mean, they may fight it because doctors just so we're clear, a doctor, are, not only get a facing 10 years in prison, but they're going to lose their medical license. Yeah. Are they anesthesiologists? They were medical doctors, um, who were licensed to practice. Um, and I'm not sure whether I'm not sure whether they were or not. Um, but I mean, that is I, I, I will just say that that is, um, uh, you know, uh, crazy. I mean, even if they were an anesthesiologist, that would even make it worse. Right. They'd be yeah. I'm just curious. Trouble. I, I come from a family of anesthesiologists. So I was just concerned. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. But I mean, there's no question that this was not inside the ordinary course of medical practice. And that's that's where they're. That's yeah. where they're screwed. Well, good for the, um, I forget which police department was the one. This is the, well, this is the, the United States. This Attorney's is the federal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, the good. Central District of California. Though. Yeah. I mean, great work for, you know, the investigation. Because I would think, oh, the reason that I had asked you before about what the charges were, were was I was wondering whether there was any obstruction of justice charges. Um, because I would yeah. think that one, like, Look, they had to know that at some point this was going to get to a point where, you know, the money was going to stop because this guy was going to die. And at that point, I would think that they would have covered their tracks. They did. So there is a charge here for pr providing altered and falsified medical records in the course of the investigation. So they created a medical records after the fact to show like a treatment plan mm. that turned out to be false essentially trying to influence the investigation, throw them off and so forth. Um, but yeah, and, and this is, um, I mean, this is a very significant investigation when I'm looking here in terms of investigative side. So the U S postal inspection service, which is a, a federal agency, people don't pay as much attention to perhaps, but it, they do a lot of important work in white collar criminal cases um, as well as the DEA and the LAPD and so forth. So, really impressive investigation here and it's a controlled substance piece that made this a federal offense yeah that's that what becomes the, a dea case basically yeah i mean it becomes a drug case i mean this it's smart to charge this as a drug case um that's it, it's much more straightforward to prove and that's the where all the hammer is in terms of sentencing so yeah. very significant well i hope that matthew perry gets justice you know even if it's too late So, Asha, uh, Democratic Convention was in Chicago this year. Did, were you able to catch any of it? I caught a lot of it. Um, or actually, I caught some of it. I, I was mainly relying on clips um, 
on social media to kind of get the highlights. Um, I watched, which speeches did I watch? Um, I definitely watched Kamala's speech last night. That was basically the one that I tuned in for. Yeah, I watched a good portion of the convention, not all of it. Um, I watched most of her speech as well. Uh, oh, I watched the roll minutes. call. I watched the roll call. I watched, yeah, I watched clips of the roll call. I didn't watch the entire roll call. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that was fun. I will say that it seemed to me like the Democrats this year deliberately took a uh, kind of attack where they were trying to portray themselves to mainstream Americans and basically be like, hey, we're like fun and normal and cool like people and we're totally acceptable to you. And, you know, these other guys aren't. That seemed to me to be the message. Yes. Well, also, they just had good music that actually got licensed to be used. Well, that is that. <laughs> there's that, too. Well, that's. I mean, they have a lot bigger stars and celebrities. There's, you know, this big question, I think, like, who is going to be performing, right? Is it going to be Taylor Swift? Is it going to be Beyonce? Common was in Soldier Field, but... You know, the star was Kamala. They did not want to upstage her, I think, with any celebrity. And I thought her speech was fabulous. Like, I, you know, I'm definitely, you know, I support her. Um, and I thought it was going to be, like, a good speech, you know, solid. And But I thought it was very powerful. Like, I thought it was... Um, easy to follow it made you be it especially like the part where she drove home the like what trump was about i thought even though we've been saying this like every day like the way that she presented it and maybe it's the prosecutor piece like she presented mm -hmm. it like a case the whole thing mm -hmm. um, I, deliberately and the, explicitly and, at times. and and it was it landed i thought in a way when she talked about his criminality his um, moral depravity, his uh, kowtowing and cozying up to dictators, like, you know, the what he did on January 6th. Um, it just, I think it would be, it, it was presented in a way that I think might land on a lot of people. Yeah, I do think it's it was very persuasive. I mean, I think it was also interesting because it's the first acceptance speech, um, you know, well, I would say the, say the first woman of color, but really she has the opportunity to be the first woman ever to become president of the United States. Cause obviously Hillary didn't win. Um, and she had to try to calibrate that, right. And calibrate what it's like. We haven't had a, a, a woman who's been president kind of calibrate that image. And I thought she, there was, I, it was seemed to me like there's a lot of care put into calibrating that showing strength, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and essentially, showing her somebody who could stand up not only to Trump, but to foreign adversaries and so on. I thought it was, it yeah, was the, very effective. The foreign policy and national security piece was really strong. I thought, and it very like deftly reclaimed some of these things that I think had, have been appropriated by the Republican party for so long it, without question, you know, uh, like you said, patriotism or um, being, hawkish in foreign policy and these things that I think you might traditionally associate with the Republican Party, she just kind of grabbed it back and she's like, this is us. To the yeah. point where there were a lot of, I think, uh, you know, right wing commentators who are very irritated with that. But what can they say? I mean, she's sitting there saying, I'm going to I will pass this border bill that Trump blocked, basically. Right. And they had a lot of law enforcement up there on stage throughout the convention. Uh, they had the whole thing. They had the whole sea of American flags uh, to get to your patriotism point. Um, she was very aggressive on foreign policy. So, yeah, I think it was very much meant to appeal to swing voters and to mainstream voters. I mean, it was a lot of stuff that would appeal to centrist voters. And that was, I think, very well calibrated and it probably helped her that she didn't have to go through a difficult primary where she would have had a hundred different interviews and been trying to take all sorts of positions in combat with others. She could sort of figure out what the positions were that were going to help her in the next 70 days. And then Trump was melting down. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, I was going to say tweets, but whatever they are, truths, whatever they are during it. I mean, I was I, like, where's Hunter Biden?
There's another one where it was like Walls was an assistant coach, not a coach. Like, what's up with that? So, what does Pancake think about the uh, about the Democratic National Convention? He's made a surprise appearance. If you're on YouTube, he's often around. He often makes an appearance by kind of coming through the frame as Ash is talking, and she just keeps talking. But this time, Pancake, um, he was a little bit more active. Yeah, he was a little more active. Um, are you asking what his political leanings are? Yeah, I mean, he's he's pro. He's definitely anti-dog, pro-cat. Yeah, I don't know. He might be RFK. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with him. Does he have a brain worm or whatever? He might. <laughs> yeah, he might. He might. He doesn't. He doesn't talk about politics a lot. Wise, wise cat. <laughs>